Televiziunea Română, întâlnirile JTI și Fundația Art Production vă recomandă garantat 100%. Mobilierul emisiunii este oferit de magazinul online Home Philosophy. Salutare, bine v-am regăsit la Garantat 100%. Invitata noastră din seara asta s-a născut în Olanda și este o vizionară recunoscută în întreaga lume, o personalitate marcantă a modei și a designului. Domnia sa are o mare reputație internațională de creator și specialist care anunță și analizează tendințe ale felului în care trăim. De la cum ne îmbrăcăm până la modul în care locuim sau felul în care interacționăm cu natura. Este autoarea unor studii, cărți și prezentări care se bucură de mare atenție. De asemenea, este creatoarea în Statele Unite, în Franța, în Polonia, în Olanda, a unor instituții de cercetare și educație care au câștigat o mare influență internațională. Invitata noastră creează concepte de produse pentru unele dintre cele mai importante companii din lume. Activitatea domniei sale a fost recunoscută prin mari distinții de stat și titluri universitare onorifice în mai multe părți ale lumii. Mulțumim organizatorilor Forumului Mazars pentru mijlocirea acestei întâlniri. Doamnelor și domnilor, suntem onorați să-i spunem bun venit la Garantat 100%, doamnei Lee Edelcourt. Good evening! Good evening. Thank you so much for accepting this invitation. Thank you for having me here. Are you familiar with this type of convention, with this type of TV convention? Not Are you all. relaxed with it? I am. Okay, cool. I'm very happy to hear that. So I'll begin abruptly with a quotation from yourself. Okay. It's from the manifesto for the next decade. And you say, we have to save textiles. The industry of textiles is battling to survive, end of quotation. I mean, any person who's not familiar with the topic will say, what is this lady talking about? We live in a world of textiles. What happens with the textiles? Well, the thing is that the um, way of making is changing and that people who have the um, traditions of dyeing and making yarns and producing are dying, disappearing. So gradually the know-how and the knowledge is disappearing. Uh -huh. And so um, 10 years ago, it looked like we were only going to have denim and t-shirts and sweatshirts. And actually most furniture was not in fabric, but was in you know, wood or plastic or metal. And it looked like uh, the signs I got from the industry, Italy, Turkey, Uh, France, they said, you know, this is not going to survive. You know, there was really a, a crisis. Uh, in the meantime, I think we are catching up a little bit, but especially the know-how of weaving, the know-how of making uh, has been lost. People also don't know how to describe textiles. So the press is saying, ah, oh, print, but it's jacquard. Jacquard is a very difficult weaving to make a pattern. Mm -hmm. People just don't know anymore. Why would that be important for me, for example, to know what's the difference in between printed textile or a woven textile? It's a, it's a difference in price. Print is a much cheaper way of m creating motif. Yes. Whereas Jacquard is uh, one of the oldest computers of the world, uh, creating a, a system where you are weaving the pattern. So mm -hmm. the pattern is a bit more dense, more rich made for a beautiful coat or a beautiful vest. Or yes. So Gucci, uh, for instance, has reintroduced this. And so um, I think it's very much from this time that we see this coming back. And f by some big um, electronic companies, the, it's used also to have um, um, yarns, which are actually wired yarns. So you can use your phone with your garment and so on. So strangely, It's very old, but it's also very contemporary. What would you answer if somebody will tell you um, this is nostalgia, this is um, um, extravagance, 
what happens if textiles are plastic? Plastic works perfectly all right. What happens if the print is print? Print works perfectly. It doesn't matter if it's woven or not. Well, it is a different performance in shape, so you won't have the same shape, so you come then to a very normality of uh, what, is, what is an offer. Mm -hmm. This is what is happening in fashion, so it's all the time the same, which makes that there is no need to buy, which is also good, but uh, for other reasons. Um, there is a stagnation, I would say, in creation because of lack of interest in, uh, in shape and material and yarn. And all these things are becoming very important also for the climate. So I would uh, highly recommend to rethink the whole subject of textile, actually. Do you know what some of my compatriots will say in this very moment? And I stress upon this, like some of my compatriots. They will say, well, we respect the reputation of your guest, but come on. This is extravagance from a very civilized and a very bored civilization. Why should we bother to think about resources? Why should we bother to think about the planet? What's the connection in between textiles and planet? We produce 150 billion garments a year for 7 billion people. From the 7 billion people, 2 billion don't have garments. They just have a piece of cloth. From the 5 billion which are left, 2 billion only buy a t-shirt or a sweatshirt a year. So for 3 billion people, we are producing 150 billion garments. That is sick. Wow. Well, you know, when you talk about figures, and then the instantaneously things change. Then the 150,000 items are all wrapped in plastic. Then in bubble wrap, then in cardboard. Then, so it's not only just the items themselves. It's um, ferocious. It's like a mountain of facts, as a matter of fact. Yeah, yeah. This is a mountain of facts. So it's 10% of the global warming is due to textile and fashion. Wow. Um, what do you mean when you say, and I quote, when you buy now a t-shirt, you kill somebody, end of quotation. These it's are hard words. Yeah, it's a price problem. Um, the um, marketing, the global marketing has, you know, pushed the prices lower and lower, or even in the car industry, by the way, everywhere. And this makes that uh, a T-shirt, you have first have the seeds, then you have to seed, then you have to grow, then you have to harvest, then you have to make yarns, then you have to make the yarn beautiful, then you have to knit, then you have to cut, then you have to finish, then you have to print, then you have to put the label, then you have to package, and then you have to ship, right. then you have to undo, then you have to put it on a hanger, then you have to sell it, and then it's somewhere. That cannot be cheaper than a croissant or a sandwich. It's not possible. And how so do we in the process, yeah. somebody is suffering very much, and that's mostly the people who are harvesting, who are cutting, or sitting on the floor, kids, women, mothers. It's a fact of life. But we should not accept it anymore. What would you answer if somebody tells you, a virtual viewer will tell you, suddenly we think of the people who are suffering. Um, how come? Because of the... The, the, I think the overload, we, we have reached a point of uh, no return and now we need to break. My advice would be to have um, a price um, regulation as you have in our agriculture, you know, that tomatoes can only be di not under this price, potatoes not under this price. Same can be for culottes and t-shirts and so. Just to sort of bring up a bit, you know, give some of the nobility of the thing itself, right? And uh, to society. And we spend much more money on food than we do actually on these things. But people will hate you when they hear you saying that because they will say, that's the lady who would like to... Us to pay more. Yes. Absolutely, I would like you to pay more. <laughs> because I think you don't need as many. If you would pay more for a more beautiful item, 
and you would love it more. Now we have come to the point that people buy things, they don't even take it out of the bag when they come home. They forget about it. Yes. So there is this wasteful um, moment in time where people think that they have to buy a new thing every day or every party. Whereas if you really have a beautiful dress, you rather have you know a new party to wear it again because you're so happy with this dress but because of this idea that we have to change which is not real change mm -hmm. because it's the same thing more or less but it looks a bit different for instagram and so on this makes that we are just producing wildly all this stuff and it's now getting totally out of control as is the plastic my god but i was thinking of Lots of ladies that I know, lots of men that I know, that will say, each of them will say, I'm very far from the idea of wearing the same dress or the same shoes from one party to another. I know. There's one person who is doing this, which is the Queen of the Netherlands. She, on purpose, is uh, wearing outfits at least five times. And Kate Middleton is also doing it. And some stars are starting to do it because everybody understands that this needs to be broken, this strange idea that you don't exist if you don't have a new right. uh, item. So we are there, you know, we, it's not about our clothes. It's also about clothes, but it, they are just there to hold you up. You know? <laughs> They're not, they should not overshout you. So um, it's also true that if you have a lot of clothes, I always notice when I go on holiday and I have a few things mm -hmm. that suddenly I say, ah, it's very nice to have this flower with this jack. And at home with all the things, I cannot see it. Whereas if I have a few things, I can, mm -hmm. I can become more creative with less. So the whole idea is to do things more slow and to do things more or less. And sort of a fasting of fashion. And it's, ha it's happening with young fasting people. Fasting of fashion. Yeah. That sounds in a very People are fasting also with, uh, with food. So there is this, uh, there's now a movement in London saying, uh, don't buy in the month of September. Mm -hmm. So, um, because in September you want to be the new person for the winter. And if you wouldn't, you know, buy in the month of September, you come over your habit. It's like going off drugs somehow. And there is a young girl who made, uh, a hashtag ban fashion for her final diploma of the Royal College of Art instead of making clothes. So there's a young generation, the young people in your country, the young people looking at your program tonight, they will agree with me because they know. And they are activists and they are striking and they know that we need to, they are endangered species. We are endangered species. Yes. We'll talk further on about endangered mm. species, but that's what sometimes we call hipsters. And hipsters is always a limited category. When we talk about hipsters nowadays, there were hipsters in, I know, in antiquity. There were hipsters all over time. Mm. But when we talk about hipsters today, we always think of a very limited category of people. And when I talk about the large category of people, that category will never think about clothes in connection with food. They will never make a problem out of the fact that a piece of garment is cheaper than a croissant. They will. Why is a piece of garment cheaper they will, than a croissant? They will. You, you, you. You have really to listen to people because the times are changing quickly. And I really felt that this summer especially that I got so many requests for text and interview always on this subject, yep. always on this subject. And there's more and more brands who are getting their act together, who are making almost 100% ecological stuff, which is also very nice. You know, it's also, it should be very beautiful also. So it's not suffering, it's like just becoming normal again. Uh, this situation has not been like this forever. Mm -hmm. Even in the 90s, we were a bit more sort of reasonable, reasonable about it. You know, you would have a winter coat for a few seasons and so on. What about buying fur?
for example. Cannot be done, done anymore. Why not? Because you cannot kill animals. If you love animals so much, if you love your dog and your cat and your rabbit and your tortoise, mm -hmm. you cannot do this. Mm, someone could tell you that this is in the very essence, in the very intimate fiber of the human being. What of would course, you answer? People love it because it's very fetishistic. And I love fur as a material, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. But there is now a new situation in the world that we are trying to figure out what is our relationship to animals. Uh, we are giving sort of ownership of this world. Well, we are not treating it very well. Not to use the F word here. I mean, it's really, we don't do a good job about it. So everybody knows. Is that applying to leather as well? Yes, now they are doing this test to make leather without animals. So it's uh, a startup um, with the DNA of animals. They make, they grow leather. Mm -hmm. And they can possibly also grow fur, I'm sure. And they can grow meat also to have animal less meat. And it's good because they can make it as big as they want. They can change the color in the DNA. They can make the crocodile even more yep. beautiful. But I am doubting... Is this feasible, practically? Yeah, it is already mm -hmm. there. But my question is, do we still want to have it if it's no longer animal? Because we love the animal because it's fetishist. So it might just lose its character. Um, you say that many designers nowadays do clothes in no more fashion. What do you mean by that? Um, Historically, and in my view also, and in my experience, fashion is made by people who are able to change really the way, not only the way you look, but also even the way you move, the way you behave, the way you dance, the way you flirt. Because they do something with your silhouette which makes it longer, or more volume, or more, a bit more shoulder, or more whatever happens. The last person to do that was Asdin Alaya, who made this very slim, you know, elastic body, still in front today. And after that, we have not seen one designer making a new shape. So it's just a repetition of a, one more trench coat, one more blouson, one more pant. But it's, there is no breakthrough anymore of a new, truly new silhouette. How would you define fashion, as a matter of fact? Uh, fashion has been um, the culture and the skill and the art sometimes of bringing close to people which are elevating them, beautifying them, uh, explaining them, um, exacerbating them. So mm -hmm. it's, it, it is um, a tool for us to communicate with others, to say, this is my grand entrance, this is who I am and so on. So it's always been a culture. Isn't this addressed to a very limited category of people? No, this was for everybody. Mm -hmm. Because then Asdin Alaya would influence everybody else. Or Saint Laurent would influence everybody else. Or Kenzo would influence everybody else. So this doesn't happen anymore. We, ha we are just producing clothes, which is OK, why not? If we want to be normal, let's be normal. And why do you say? And that sounds very interesting. Fashion is out of fashion. Mm. Why is, how can fashion be out of fashion? It's very bizarre. <laughs> All my life as a forecaster, I could use fashion because fashion was running in front of other right. domains. And suddenly came sort of during the 90s or something, end of the 90s, fashion was losing that capacity to anticipate and I was working in the design academy. I could see my students in design working together, no longer ego, uh, having projects together, living, using the tools together. Um, it became a whole new society of cooperation and team and mm -hmm. not fixed, but very fluid form of, of being together, living together, working together. And, Fashion is still today, you know, this one person, this one designer who is, you know, the catwalk designer. 
and there's maybe 200 designers in his team, nobody knows them. They, their, their names are never written. Right. In cinema, right. you have the driver, you have yes. the caterer. Everybody has the right to participate in this culture. Whereas fashion has completely ignores that we are now in a society which wants to do things together, mm -hmm. which wants us to be less sort of unique and be more, yeah, um, more in dialogue with others. So compared to all other activities and creativities, dance, the theater, yep. film, and so, it's old fashioned because it doesn't understand its time. I don't know why this is. It's not catching up. How should I perceive this situation when I think of your examples? Mm. Um, and when I think of this particular place we are in this very moment, it's about you and me. It'll never be about everybody who's here. The guys over there, the guys over here. Nobody knows them. I mean, the definition of this type of performance, which is not the only type of performance, is you and me. And that'll be all. Will that survive? Well, there's more now television shows where you actually see the musicians when there's I interaction with cameramen, mm -hmm. especially in American television. Yeah. You see that they are they are pulling you guys, you know, to us. So I think it's happening that all this it becomes more transparent. Maybe there's less decor and more reality. Or if <laughs> yeah, it's sort of. Where will this go if the idea of democratization is running and running and running? It'll be another extreme, it'll be another challenge, it'll be another limit. Where's the limit of democracy? I think there will be always Picassos and there will always, always uh, Kalas, you know, once in a while. Yep. There will be somebody who stands out and he is knocking everybody off its feet. But maybe because we are so many, it will become more rare. It will become more black sheep of the family than before. Yes, because we begin to hate the person who becomes an institution. Yeah. And you see in families you know, now that uh, young kids are very happy to be with the grandparents. Before that was not happening. So the grandparents spend money on them. They help the grandparents on Netflix yeah. and it's a perfect combination. Parents and kids, they are much more together. They are really friends. That was not the case before. So there is this new social uh, net, network, uh, cohesive, mm -hmm. which is, I think, very beautiful. And you see that also in student life and so on. Yes. And I think we are going to a better society because of it. It's nobody who gave that rule. It came from grassroots came by itself. You're not afraid of this? No. Look at the new father. This started in Japan and then I started to see it everywhere in the world. Is that suddenly, around 10 years ago, I suddenly saw all these men carrying the babies. You know, no women anymore carrying babies, just men. They carry them very different, you know, like a bag of salt yes. or like a, a, some sort of bowl. Very, it's very cute, you know? but they're very tender. They're very attentive. And these new fathers, they bring tenderness to men. So men don't want to go to war. So men like other colors, they have a new form. They, have a new, they are a new person. So there is an <laughs> em emancipation of society. At this Some will point. tell you that this is that category which is called the emasculated category that there are no men anymore. Well, they, they are just... They sometimes <laughs> also go in the woods and howl and do some cano or they go on a plank or... They still also do all these male things. They also barbecue. But they combine, they're hybrids. They are both. Mm -hmm. And so this means that the role of women is also to be redefined. Then the role of age is different because there's no age. People have, you know, the age they want and so... In a way, everything is a bit upside down, down. Everything is in the process of change. And as far as I can see, there is not many negative in this change. Are you aware you of the fact... You can be cynical mm -hmm. about it, but it, it's not negative. But are you aware of the fact that in a traditional society, your points of view 
could be read in a dangerous key. They could be interpreted as stirring what is more humane, personal and traditional in ourselves. I mean, Romania is a rather traditional society. Some people hearing you right now will say, ah, a Dutch lady. We know lots of things about Holland. Uh, they smoke weed. They're much too free than they it have should. Prostitutes. They have prostitutes. There's this whole discussions with men and men, women and women, and gender fluid and stuff like that. That's the end of humanity. That's the end of the world. That's the end of divinity. How would you answer to that? Would you have an answer for that? I think it's true that we are drifting apart. So I agree uh, in some way. But you know, if you look at the Netherlands as a project, yep. a political project and a societal project, it's pretty well done. When I, come, I live in Paris, when I go back to the Netherlands, which I don't do so often, I'm amazed. It's clean. People are quite fluid in the way they move in life. They don't, you know, it's not like in France. Yep. Uh, there's no beggars. There's no homeless. Everybody has health care. There's good food. Air is not clean enough, but it's cleaner than in some other countries. Uh, there's no poverty. There is uh, real democracy from extreme left to extreme right. And they don't like each other, but they do. It's not like <laughs> the cows in England. Yep. Uh, so many people on uh, bikes and so people use the waterways. It's pretty good. No? So you can say, oh, this Dutch, you know, this smoking. <laughs> Let them smoke if it's a good plan, right? Let's get back to fashion just for one minute. Sometimes... But I believe you are please. underestimating your audience. No, I'm not underestimating my audience. I just try to represent some of the people from my audience. But Romanians are like everybody else. Yes, they are. I fully agree, but I really strive, I really make authentic efforts to ask questions they that I am ask. very positive they will ask. Mm. Okay. Uh, and I assume this mission. Mm. I mean, I just take it authentically. Mm. Right. And this is in the very direction mm -hmm. of this discussion. Some people will think that couture is perceived as an extravagance, a defiance, an offense towards typical people from, let's say, the middle or the lower class. That what would true. you answer to that? It is true. I recently wrote an uh, opinion piece for design, design magazine. Yes. And it's called The Beheading of Culture. Yes in which I'm um, blasting the extravaganza of the Metropolitan yes. uh, Museum Open, yep. and in which I suddenly had a vision, but a real vision, eh? like I went back straight to Marie Antoinette and the guillotine, and I thought, oh my God, this is not going to go well. We are running into a moment that the masses are going to kill the 1%, or the extravagance of the 1%. It's very dangerous. I feel that I've, because I'm part of my job is to feel things earlier than others. I feel a fear and it was confirmed in the same week by a very young writer, a blogger, exactly saying the same thing. He says, America is Versailles. He said exactly the same. He also spoke about UT. So I was not the only one. He's very young. I'm very old. We both had the same, we went through the same tunnel vision. Mm -hmm. And so if we feel that, if we are trespassing a certain sort of dignity, I think it's not going to fly. So I'm afraid. Quotation from yourself. Embracing trees will replace holding our smartphones. It's very popular. There's this sudden amazing sort of interest in forests and trees. 
because science is now really discovering that trees are actually so intelligent, the most intelligent growers in mm -hmm. the world, that their system underground to um, communicate and to warn each other and so and to help yep. each other, to cure each other, is much better than our internet. That is actually amazingly powerful. So all the big uh, smart producers in the world are looking now at the forest for inspiration. So we go into a biotech type situation. Then, in, especially in Japan, they have found out that if you go in the forest n only 15 minutes to 20 <laughs> minutes a day, yep. that your tension is lower, that your heartbeat is slower, that you feel more happy, that it can combat all forms of um, nostalgia and melancholy and maybe even depression. And so they call it forest bathing, you know, taking mm -hmm. a bath in the forest. And then part of this is to embrace trees to um, yeah, to sort of lean against nature to be together. The same thing is happening with house plants, especially young people are, you know, taking a lot of plants in the house, and then the kids are also making all the little mm -hmm. sprouts. So there's this whole thing where we need so much. You know, we have we are so out of touch with nature that we have we need those recipes, like cure. It's like mm. yeah. I'll switch to, to hard words now, with your kind permission. Um, Not too hard, I hope. Well, I'm afraid it's about reality, a palpable reality. What would you answer to this convention with the virtual viewer, who could tell you that something like this. Lee Edelcourt, your discourse is right, is wonderful very logic, very settled. Um, but you're a part of classical Europe. You're a part of the classical civilization. You're a part of the post-colonial world. People from the colonies are coming upon you. They will occupy you. You are extinct. End of quotation. Mm. What would you answer? I will not, because I'm working with the Southern Hemisphere very much. And I'm fully aware of the situation in the world. Uh, I have students, white students, which actually have white guilt. So they're suffering. They have real... Let's stay for just one minute here. How will you define very explicitly white guilt? I don't have it, so I don't know exactly how it feels. But it's because we have this past, which we uh, cannot deny and which is suddenly resurging very, very strongly in the young generations. Um, we are confronted with it almost uh, daily. And people make big mistakes because there's lots of words or ideas you cannot use anymore, images. So you have to be very careful not to appropriate culture. And if you do, to do it in a very, very humble and uh, open and transparent mm -hmm. way. Um, I made a whole book about this because my opinion is, I made a whole book about folklore to show that same things happen in all cultures. So that same uh, expressions, same shapes, same colors, same motifs, same symbols, same finishes, same skirts, whatever, are not unique to one culture. They're mm -hmm. actually, the human brain has somehow in different areas of the world made the same thing, the, ma the same culture. So instead of dividing this, this is harmonizing us because we are not alone as a species, as a tribe and so on. So my opinion is, I once had to give an answer to a um, Native American asking this question about appropriation of her, their motifs and yep. so. I said, it's horrible what happens because your beautiful carpets are printed on polyester dresses and it looks like shit. Let's face it, it's a, it's a horror story. I said, but on the other hand, I also have to tell you that you cannot own a pattern. Because that same pattern I can find in India, I can find possibly in Mongolia, I can possibly find it somewhere in near South Africa. And this is why I wanted to make this study to say to people, listen, 
I understand and things need to be better canalized, but you cannot completely own. I'm very curious to find out why don't you feel the white guilt? Because I've always been working with um, the whole planet. Mm -hmm. So I've been integrated in cultures from a very young age, whether it's Africa or Japan uh, or Korea or South America, Brazil and so on. So I'm, it's like I'm part of them. I've, they've, nobody ever made me feel I'm not welcome or I'm not uh, respected. Mm -hmm. or I'm not um, helpful. So maybe I'm bridging certain things, I don't know. They d I, I don't seem to bother them. Some could tell you that this is the definition of the authentic colonial master. I don't feel like a colonial master. <laughs> you know, this was for <laughs> long before my time. And I, the Dutch were ferocious in this whole story. So there's um, nothing we can deny here. Mm -hmm. And I'm fully aware. But I'm, I'm not going to feel guilt for it, no. And I don't merit guilt because I'm just handling it the way it should be handled. I'm actually predicting in the same sort of emancipation mm -hmm. story that the Southern Hemisphere will jump on center stage and become very important and influent in the world. world. So I'm actively working on this. Quotation. We'll witness a rebirth of analog that will eventually lead to hybrid society that will combine high technology and objects created and produced in a classical way. Could this be a world also with high-tech society and low-tech societies? Yeah, Would that be possible? They can be separate, but uh, what I see happening is that they're merging. Mm -hmm. So the high-tech companies are trying to become more tactile and more humble and more human and more... Um, ideally, they want their products to become intuitive. They don't have a chance otherwise. Yeah. And uh, since they're not, there is a sort of backlash and there is especially in uh, Japan, but also in larger Asia, a comeback of reading. In America, there's a comeback of poetry. There's yes. a comeback of jazz. So there's many small signs that the analogy, there's m many brands also now called analog or analog or mm -hmm. bars and so. And this is also because we are becoming so much alone. So the backlash of the smart area where people don't know how to connect anymore, yep. don't know how to flirt anymore, don't know how to kiss anymore, don't know how to say to somebody in the street, I love you or I like you. This is also something which is so scary. Come on, if I say I like you now on the street, it'll be harassment. No, oh, it depends how you say it. I, would say. I like you. It'll be harassment. No, for instance, in... <laughs> I in will not say, I like you. No, say, but for I instance, like in Morocco, you know, the young boys, they still say, gazelle, you know. It's cute. Mm -hmm. There's a way to do it. But it's dying. It's dying art of seduction. And I see all my young people, you know, when somebody from school comes to visit and then makes a pass at them, they're like, flabbergasted, they, you know, they get red <laughs> in the face and they are, oh, Lee, he wanted to go out with me. And they don't know how to react. It's crazy. When you have to think of future tendencies, um, what about housing? What about living in the houses the future? Um, how will they look like, not necessarily from an aesthetic point of view, but from the very philosophy of living? Is something substantially changing? The spiritual house. What's that? The spiritual house. It's a house where you leave room for the spirit, for the soul. 
where you have, um, it's more like creating a, a sanct sanctuary. Mm -hmm. So cre creating space, creating stillness, creating um, light. It doesn't have to be big. Actually, there is a tendency to small houses, smaller windows, mm -hmm. and sort of neat packaging of yourself. Can you do that in a block of flats? Yeah. It's all in the proportion. You see that when you go in a hotel room, mm -hmm. right? The one hotel room yep. of, of 30 square meters and the other one is not at all the same. Right. Because somehow they're in an angle or something. Mm -hmm. So one feels wonderful and the other one feels like prison. Don't let me interrupt you. I'll just correct this and it's part of the life. Okay. It's okay. <laughs> Good. Um, You're not harassing me, are you? <laughs> no. <laughs> but I can say I like you. That's nice. It's not Thank harassment. You. <laughs> okay, um, and two more questions. Um, isn't this concept of sanctuary a tendency to extract yourself from the community if you have enough money and live in a sanctuary together with people of your kind in an isolated and defended area? No, I think it can be in any area can be any budget. It's certainly about living together also. It's about sharing. That's a big part of the new life. Mm -hmm. And that is, of course, by choice of which you, who you want to be with, your family, your friends, your neighbors. But, you know, look at the neighborhood uh, festivals. They are getting more and more popular. They do hang yeah. out with you, your whole neighborhood. In many cities, there is um, markets and people exchange goods and clothes and it's pretty nice I think so you don't have to be alone you don't have to be separate if you don't want to I think my real last two questions first of all this is a devil's disciple position one more yeah uh, yep here's a virtual quotation hard one Lee the court you are obsolete you are overwhelmed by what's happening at an incredible speed rate nowadays, that you feel the need to defend your own generation and your own status quo. You have to accept that the natural extinction of species refers to your way of thinking as well. A new world is emerging, you cannot stop it. End of quotation. Yeah, I feel the reverse actually. <laughs> Because I work with very young people, mm -hmm. so I keep being very inspired by what goes on in the minds of younger generations. My students now are, you know, from 21 to maybe 30 is the oldest, not even. And so I get feedback of, uh, you know, on how they think and I look at their work and see how this, and they come from all over the world, yep. so it's also interesting there. But I've always been more young than my students because this is my job. You know, I'm, I am always living in the future. I'm actually now thinking of making, a, working on a book for 2050. Mm -hmm. I want to make a big jump because I did that for 2020. And the one for 2020 is 100% what is happening. So I want to see if I can do it again. And so I'm constantly living before everybody else. So I'm not concerned about now, actually. Um, and, you know, if mm -hmm. people want to think that I'm obsolete, they can, because, of course, I have a certain age. But that is also um, segregational thinking, and it's <laughs> even sort of age um, non-democracy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I believe that it has nothing to do with age, actually. It's, uh, it's quite incredible how the brain can some, the brain or this intuition yeah. I, I master can just live on its own and just jump out of my body and go somewhere and just catch information. And it has not, it's not even in myself, I would say. How will you contradict? How will you have an argument, a reason, a thought for this? There are lots of thinkers, philosophers, old ones and new ones. They will tell you something similar with this. There's an interior pulsation that leads 
mankind to its own extinction. How will you answer to that? Yeah, it's pessimistic thinking. It's not trying to elevate man where he can be. I think that maybe there is an impulse, but you can also fight the impulse. And I would strongly suggest that we do fight our destiny of being extinct, because there is still, I think, some nice things to discover. There's, it's still pretty good to be alive. So why would we give it up? So I'm fighting for our survival. There's a very in interesting trend, a sort of a happiness of accepting extinction. It's very interesting. Yeah, it and goes also very with toxic. an enormous um, raise in the suicide. Mm -hmm. We are living in a sort of new romanticism also. This is why the suicide is also so strong. Uh, but for some kids, you know, it's just unlivable th that there is no future. They cannot cope with it. Uh, others are finding their amazing ways. So um, I think we need to correct a certain number of things. And then maybe we can sort of navigate the whole thing. You know, living is like sailing. You have to, you cannot go straight because then you go bad. So you need to do this and sort of educate yourself, help yourself, sing, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, do something different, right? Dance. Lee Court, thank you so much for accepting Take this invitation. It's been a privilege to have you here. It was very nice thank because you. it's very rare that I have such sharp questions. Thank you. Thank you. Tuturor celor care sunt alături de garantat 100%, mulțumim frumos pentru încredere. Ne vedem data viitoare. Not the book.